This is Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's what we were. If you're in Christ, that's what you were. But next it says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Come on, somebody. By grace, you've been saved. I wonder if I can get an excited church today. Excited about what Jesus has done for us. For gra- by grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I just wanted to remind you before we jump in today, we are saved by grace, not by works. We're saved by grace, not by anything we can do. We're saved by grace, not by how much we go to church. We're saved by grace. And only by grace. We're saved by salvation in Christ. It's a free gift. We don't have to pay anything for it. Jesus already paid for it. However, you might have noticed it also said at the end that we're saved for something. We're not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. We're not saved by our own efforts, but we are saved for some good efforts in this world. And so I wanna talk to you today on the topic of being dressed like a dead guy. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't look dead at all. Just give him a look over real quick. That's the title of the message, dressed like a dead guy. Heavenly Father, today we need to hear from you. We're we're opening up our our minds, our hearts to what you want to do. Holy Spirit, uh, this is your place. It's not ours. This is your domain. We're ready to receive. If if there needs to be conviction, even though it might not be comfortable, would you bring it? Where there needs to be change, would you change us? Where we have been immature in our faith, would you teach us and grow us? By the power of your word, God, we love you, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. High five three people. Tell them you don't look dead. (laughs) Dressed like a dead guy. We're in a collection of messages this fall called Firm Foundations, if you're just catching up. Um where our goal is to build your faith stronger than ever before. And the way we're doing that is we're bringing clarity and understanding as well as real world application to the the most basic doctrines of the Christian faith that are either the most misunderstood in the world today or they're the most under attack in the world today. And today we're gonna cover salvation, justification, sanctification. Salvation, justification, sanctification. Say it with me. Salvation, justification, sanctification. This is not a a fall at Revolution Church where you can walk in and be lazy about your faith. I'm just going to tell you like it is. You you might need an extra espresso shot before you walk into church this fall, y'all. You know what I'm saying? You're going to have to walk in and say, okay, let's do some work. Let's do some heavy lifting. I encourage you to walk in with your Bible, with a notebook, with a pen, ready to receive, ready to learn. Okay, salvation, justification, sanctification. This should be six weeks of sermons. Y'all pray for me. I'm gonna try and do it in one, all right? Soteriology is the theological term for this branch of theology, soteriology. Soteriology includes uh, atonement, uh, grace, original sin, redemption, repentance, regeneration, adoption, 
It includes justification and even final glorification. And I'm just, I'm just throwing all that out there to show you like one sermon ain't gonna get you across the finish line, okay? And what's much better than you taking all of your, your spiritual um, well-being and maturity and trusting one guy named Zach with it is for you to take responsibility for your spiritual growth and say, wow, I didn't know some of this stuff. I need to lean in and learn even more. And yes, you can come to church. You can get a jump start. And I'm going to do everything I can to hold your hand and, and teach you everything that we need to learn from the Word of God. But you're also going to have to engage in this lifelong process where you're learning and applying these truths to your life. Let's start at the start today with salvation. And you've got some definitions at the top of your handout because we want to make sure every week you get these, these most critical parts of the doctrines we're studying right. We want to make sure you have it word for word. So salvation is when the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross provides the only way of salvation through the forgiveness of sin. Salvation occurs when people place their faith in the death and the resurrection of Christ as a sufficient payment for their sin. Salvation is a gift, as we just read, from God, and it cannot be earned through our own efforts. Salvation is, is God's total work, not our work, God's total work of bringing us from death to eternal life, from condemnation to justification. And I want to take you through this one story in John chapter 11 today. It's about a guy named Lazarus. You might have heard his name before. And I'll kind of set the stage for the story. Jesus has these, these three close friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And Lazarus gets really sick. He ends up dying. And Jesus is traveling with the disciples. The disciples don't know Lazarus is dead, but Jesus does because he's Jesus, right? And he basically says, hey, guys, I want to go see my, flint, my friend Lazarus. Okay, start in verse 11. He said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. And the disciples are so confused because they're like, we got to go to Bethany. That's way out of the way. You want to go travel to wake somebody up? What is, what's good? The Bible's funny. You, you don't think the Bible's funny? You think the Bible's boring? The Bible's not boring. You're boring. Read the Bible. Okay, so <laughs> the disciples, they recognize Jesus is Lord. He's in charge. He's a leader, not, not us, but they're still kind of trying to argue a little bit. So, so it says the disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, like, he'll be all right. Do we really need to go all the way over there and wake him up? He'll, he'll get better, right? Like he's sleeping, he's sleeping good, I assume. He's, he's gonna be fine, he's on the mend. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, and I, I picture Jesus doing it like this, right? <laughs> Lazarus is dead, boneheads, right? Like that's kind of how he's saying it. He just says it plain, Lazarus is dead. And you and I, if we're going to understand salvation, for us to even have the free gift of salvation, we have to understand that same simple statement is true about us. We are dead in our sin. Until you understand that one thing, you don't have to understand anything else, but until you understand that one thing, you literally cannot actually place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and receive the free gift of salvation. It starts with an understanding, you're dead. I'm dead. Every one of us, completely broken in every way. That's the start of the gospel. Now, you can start to see why the world has such a problem with the gospel today. Because the world likes to think, ain't nothing wrong with me. Like whatever I feel like is true is totally true, so my life is perfectly fine. I'm perfectly good. I'm not bad. And none of that's the gospel. The gospel is, no, without Jesus, you're dead. That's the core of the gospel. That you're not born innocent. I'm not born innocent. We're born with a bend towards sin. And then at some point we begin to sin. And we are guilty before God. We are condemned because of our sin. You will never understand the power of salvation and the gospel in your life until you can understand that one thing. You are dead. Romans 5.12 says, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. The gospel, the Bible, um, it's not a book about how to have a better life, though the book does absolutely make your life a lot better without a doubt. 
Rather, the Bible, it's all about the difference between dead people and people that are alive. This entire book has this concept sprinkled all over it. In every passage of scripture, you see the concept of salvation. We're dead in our sin. We need to be brought back to life. So Jesus and the disciples, they get over to where Lazarus is and Jesus meets Martha out on the road. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus is like, no, no, I'm talking about like right now, lady. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, she told him. Salvation is sprinkled into this passage. I have always believed you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's come into the world from God. So just like Martha had to answer that question, you and I have to answer the same question. Do you believe this? Do you believe by faith, even though you can't yet fully explain it? Do you choose to believe by faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the only one that can raise you from death to life? Faith in Jesus is the only thing that can bring resurrection. And if you're dead and I'm dead, what you need and what I need is resurrection. Amen? Only faith in Jesus brings resurrection. Only faith in Jesus can bring us back to life. Salvation, the term I like to use is regeneration. Because in that faith-filled moment, when you say yes to Jesus, you are regenerated. You are brought back to life. To take some language from the Bible, you are born again. And regeneration leads to justification. You see, our sin separates us. We're not just dead in our sin. Our sin also separates us from holy God. But the blood of Jesus moves us from a place of guilt and condemnation to a place of acquittal and acceptance. So you're born again. You're literally a brand new creation in the moment of salvation, but you are also simultaneously back in right relationship with God, justified. Not perfected, but justified. Back in right standing with God. Made alive again. And this happens, Romans 3.19, by his power, not by your power. Romans 3.24, by his grace. Romans 5.9, by his blood. Galatians 2.16, through your faith. See, the Bible reminds us over and over and over, without Jesus, we're dead in our sin. There is nothing you can do to be brought back to life. You can't go to heaven on your own. You can't be good enough your way into the kingdom. You can't do it. But Jesus already did it. He finished the work by his power, by his grace, by his blood, through your faith. Until you understand you're dead. You cannot be brought back to life. Okay, now, you know how on your internet browser you got all the tabs? You got the Lazarus tab open right now? I need you to do a little mental trick with me. Open a new tab. Can you do that? Just open up another tab. We're going to come back to the Lazarus tab, but open up a new tab. Everybody good? If you're good, say, yeah, I got it. I got a new tab open. Okay, awesome. Let's open up a new tab, and I want to talk about sanctification, and this is where I wanted to spend most of our time together because I feel like it's the most misunderstood initial part of the Christian faith the most misunderstood part of salvation. And I, I wanna like put salvation and sanctification side by side because it might just kind of help you see it. So salvation is the power of God's grace to rescue us from eternal death. Bring us back to life, justify us. Sanctification is the exact same power. Same God, same power of God's grace, but now continually for the rest of our lives at work in our lives to change us. Does that make sense? And this is so important for you to understand and grasp because so many people express faith in Jesus, latch on to salvation, but never step over into sanctification. And then what happens is they fall for so many lies 
I've been a pastor over 20 years now. I've seen it time and time again. It's so heartbreaking every time it happens, but there's a common theme every time it happens. Somebody leaves church, leaves the faith, says, forget God. I want nothing to do with him after a salvation moment. How does that happen? It happens because people never move into this other movement of salvation called sanctification. And so they're not living the way God's called them to live, which means they don't experience the result God wants us to see us experience in our lives. It means we're, we're not leaning into God. We, we don't understand joy and hope and, and meaning in darkness and that God is with us in darkness. And we just have this very basic misunderstanding of God. Basically, we, we never take the reins and say, it's my responsibility to grow up in my faith. And so people stay confused and people get led astray and people get tricked by all kinds of lies in the world. So I want you to take a, if that sounds like your life at all, I want you to take a close look with me at sanctification. Okay, so definition of that. Sanctification is the ongoing process of yielding to God's word and his Holy Spirit in order to complete the development of Christ's character in us. It is through the present ministry of the Holy Spirit and the word of God that the Christian is enabled to live a godly life. Okay, so you got that new tab open. I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians with me. I want to give you some context. This is a great passage for sanctification. This is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church in Thessalonica, but to really get this, you got to understand some of what was going on in Thessalonica. This is a city where basically the rule was, go buck wild, do whatever you want. It would have made Las Vegas blush. I mean, the stuff that they did in this city when it came to sexuality, crazy. Okay? So it's in that context, Paul is encouraging the church there. And this is a brand new church. Okay, so picture these people, they used to be a part of this culture of the city, do whatever you want, live however you want, it's all good. You're perfectly fine as you are. They've moved from all that stuff into a relationship with Jesus. They, they have experienced salvation, now he's talking to them about sanctification. And I want to start in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 1. He says, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk, we've been talking to you about this, church. Here's how you ought to walk and live so that you can please God. Just as you are doing, he's like, you're doing it, but man, you need to do it more and more. He's like, I see a little fruit, but we got to get you stronger. I want to see the fruit grow bigger in your life. There, there's still some old stuff going on. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. And then look at this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Show of hands, how many of you have ever had a moment in your faith? You're like, God, just tell me what your will for me is. God, I'm like, I'm tired, I'm fed up. I just need you to tell me what your will is. God has already told us what his will is for every believer. It's your sanctification. We like to attach the answers to that, what is God's will for me question to our profession and our spiritual gifts and our wherewithal and our degree and our connections and all kinds of things. And that's great. We need to bring Jesus into the center of every single realm of life. However, none of those are really the answer to the question, what is God's will for my life? The answer to the question, what is God's will for my life is simple. It's your sanctification. Same for me. It's my sanctification that I would keep gr growing in the faith, that you would keep going in the faith, that you just keep following Jesus, even when it's hard, that you just keep following Jesus, even when it's not the prevailing culture, that you just keep following Jesus, even when it's not easy, that you just stay focused on following Jesus all the time. Sanctification is God's will for your life. It's God's will for your life. Now, to sanctify something is to set that thing apart for its intended use. And so, you know, we got the Revolution Church ink pens and the seat back right there, just as an example. They say, uh, this pen was borrowed from Revolution Church. <laughs> I wanted them to say this pen was stolen from Revolution Church. And my wife said, that's too mean. Um, so you can borrow the pen, okay? Steal the pen, whatever. But when the pen's just sitting in the seat back, it's not sanctified, because it's not doing its job. The pen is sanctified, technically speaking, when you show up at church and take the pen out and start taking some notes. Because the purpose of the pen is that you can write down some things that you want to remember, that you want to study, that you want to lean heavier into. So in the theological sense, that's when the pen comes to life. Okay, for us, God's people, it's the same thing. We are sanctified when we start to live by 
the design and purpose God has called us to live by. And what Paul is saying here is, hey, hey church, you're living by some old ways, but God has called you to live a new way, a sanctified way. There's a new way to be human. But today what we see creeping even into the church is this idea, people want the kingdom, but they don't want the king. People want the savior to get them into heaven, but they don't want the savior to also be the Lord and the leader of every detail of life every day. Jesus has to be both. And so that's when you come into church. Listen, sometimes if we're doing church right, you're gonna feel conviction. Eat a little squirmy in your chair. That's how you know if we're doing church right. You feel a little uncomfortable. What is that? What is it when, sometimes y'all come up to me, you'll say, you were preaching directly to me. <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> Did you know over a thousand people come to our church across the four services every weekend? I don't know everybody's name anymore. Like I gave that up a long time ago, okay? I can't know your name anymore. And I love that, okay? The, the whole point of church, by the way, is not that I know everybody's name and everybody knows my, it's the whole point of church is everybody knows the name of Jesus. That's the point of church, okay? But people will come and they'll be like, you were talking directly to me. No, see, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a job. He's good at his job and he likes to do his job, doesn't he? And we show up and we gather together and part of what's promised to us in the scriptures is that when we do that, God is in this place. And the Holy Spirit is speaking, personalizing it, bringing conviction, which can bring discomfort. So then you're presented with a choice. Turn and run or listen to the Holy Spirit. Leave and ignore it and nothing changes or show up and lean into it and leave change. Now, each week I'm going to give you books. If you like to read books, you can go check out to dive into these things even more. Uh, the book this week, it's called Great Doctrines of the Bible. Great read if you want to dive in deeper. I encourage you to do that. Great Doctrines of the Bible. Here's a quote from that book that I think will help you. It says, if regeneration has to do with our nature, justification with our standing, adoption with our position, I wish I could talk about adoption today, but I can't, Th then sanctification has to do with our character and our conduct. So I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, just seeing it visually helps so much. So look at the screen with me for a second, because I want you to see the difference between salvation, that justification moment, and sanctification, okay? Because they're, they're kind of the same, and they have the same elements, but they're not the same. So justification, salvation, that's when the righteousness of Jesus, the Bible says, is imputed upon your life. So literally in the moment, boom, you say, Jesus, I place my faith and trust in you. The Bible says you receive the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's what that means. Literally, in that moment. Now when God looks, this, that's good news. You ought to be jumping on your chairs right now. That when God looks at you after you place your faith in Jesus, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. It's imputed upon you. But sanctification is Christ's righteousness imparted into your life. And this happens over time. So God says, because of Jesus and your faith in him, you are already, we say it together every week, totally righteous. And now sanctification, you start to actually live like you are who God says you are. Justification is all about what God did for us. The work is finished because of the blood of Jesus. We can be justified back in relationship with God. But sanctification is what God is doing in us. I'm trying to get you to see the nature of sancti sanctification. Justification puts us into right relationship with God. We get to be back with God. Sanctification should start to exhibit some fruit because you're back in relationship with God. Like, don't you think if you're in relationship with God again, some stuff should start to change? I'm trying to get you to see the difference here. It's so important. And also, if you just see 
Sanctification as God's rule list, okay, God says don't do this, don't do that, don't watch that, don't say that, don't listen to that. If that's all you see it as, that is part of it, but if that's all you see it as, you will never want to engage in this life-changing, life-giving, lifelong process called sanctification. And this is where so many people miss it. It's not about your perfection. It's about you yielding to the spirit of God. It's about you yielding to the authority of God's word in your life. No longer living according to the old way, but living according to God's way. Aren't you glad that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, God does not turn around and respond and say, all right, well, welcome to the family. Now I expect perfection in every way. And if you're not perfect, we boot you out. That would be bad, right? because every one of us would be hosed. Let's admit it. Instead, God says, hey, come and join me. There's a new way to live. I'll never forget about eight years ago, I needed to start living a new way. Um, I had kind of reached that point in my 30s where I realized, you know, I can't just eat trash anymore. Y'all remember in your 20s, you can eat trash and then you still feel fine. Y'all remember those days? Those days are gone. Long gone for me. And I don't know what it was. It was something about when I turned about 35, I was just like, yeah, I can't do this anymore. Like now when I eat like trash, I feel like trash and I need to change some stuff. So I got with a dietician and, and I, I did a, a study of my diet, literally wrote down every single thing I ate or drank for about three weeks and they kind of looked at it. And they basically said, Zach, your sugar intake is so high, you're on the road towards diabetes and all kinds of health issues. It, it was a wake up moment for me. I needed to live a new way. And I can be pretty extreme. So I just went home and told Amber, like, I'm done. No more sugar. Period. Starting now. And, and then the next day, I'm like, sugar sweats. Like, <laughs> you know, like, it was horrible. But I learned how to live in this new way. Now, about three months into the journey, um, I can't even remember what it was really, but I just had a bad day. Just one of those bad days. And I went home and I walked into the pantry, turned the light on. The light was shining on double stuff Oreo cookies. And I'm not making it up. I ate a whole sleeve of those. And then there were Fruit Loops. And I like some sugary cereal, so I poured those in a bowl with some milk and I ate those and then <laughs> slurped the sugary Fruit Loop milk down. That's the best milk ever. Come on, y'all. Fruity Pebble milk. Oh, I'm tempting myself now. And then I opened the freezer. I wasn't done yet, right? And we had banana pudding bluebell. <laughs> Don't get me anywhere close to that stuff. And I ate however much was in the tub. And, and y'all can all guess what happened, right? Within a few hours, oh my gosh, I felt so terrible. I was just laying on the couch. Ah, you know, my stomach hurts. Ah, but it was more than my stomach. Like, my bones hurt. Because I was partaking in sugar. I went back to that sugary diet. Now, how crazy would it be for me to, to tell my wife, well, since I messed up and had sugar, I'm just gonna go back to it. Forget what it does to me, I'm just gonna go back to the old way of living. But that's what a lot of people do. They think, oh, I messed up one time, and they go back to the sugary sin. And I'll just encourage you the way Paul was encouraging the church in Thessalonica. No, 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 you don't have to run back to it. We will mess up, but God has a plan called sanctification. Don't give up, it's a journey. You're empowered by the Holy Spirit to go on this journey. Now that all said, Paul also said some confronting things about the fact that in our sin we're dead. And so I wanna look at those too. Sanctification includes abstaining from sin. And I don't know why, but for some reason, the church stopped talking about this. The Bible is crystal clear about all kinds of things that it clearly says are sin that the world says today is not sin, even people in the church. The Bible's crystal clear that we need to abstain from these things. Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain. And then again, for them, the specific thing was from sexual immorality. But, but just, just don't worry about that today. We're gonna talk about that in a future week together. Today, I just want you to stop it, that you abstain. Because the idea here is we all have sinful things in our lives that we need to abstain from. 
The specifics could be different for every one of us. Maybe yours is like the church in Thessalonica. Maybe it is a sinful sexual thing, but there's all kinds of things the Bible says that hurt us. Greed is something we're told to abstain from. Idolatry, lying, unforgiveness, bitterness, right? Drunkenness, addiction, murder. Can we agree on that one? Murder. Let's abstain from murder, y'all, okay? Hatred in our hearts, and the list goes on and on and on. And what's the whole point of abstaining? Well, when you abstain, you draw closer to God. I love that. The point is that you begin to live in this new way, and in doing so, you draw closer to God, which is the whole point. And we are always all abstaining, by the way. You're like, I'm not abstaining, at least not intentionally. Well, you might be doing it unintentionally, but you're always abstaining because every time you say yes to something, you abstain from something else and say no to it. So just flip that script in a holy way and decide, okay, I'm going to love and therefore I abstain from hate. I am going to give and therefore I abstain from greed. I am going to serve and therefore I abstain from selfishness. I am going to forgive and therefore I abstain from bitterness. We must abstain from sin. Second, sanctification brings the revival that you want. Who in here would say we need some revival in our lives today? Oh, this is the lying service. Okay, I got it. Ten hands up. I I think we would all say we want to see revival happen. Well, sanctification is the only thing that can bring that revival. Paul tells the church in Thessalonica, he says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. That's what revival looks like. It's that there's actually real change. He's reminding us, you don't get led around and drug around by your flesh. You teach your flesh to submit to the word of God. You don't surrender to your flesh. You surrender to the Holy Spirit. It's easier to do what your flesh tells you to do. Let's all admit that. But your flesh is not God. God is God. And so often your flesh is out of sync with what God says. Amen? And what's happening today, even in the church again, is... is, People are taking the word of God and bending it. Instead of aligning their life, I'm going to do something that seems silly, but it's a great picture. Instead of saying, all right, I'm going to bend my life towards the word of God. People take the word of God and say, I'm going to bend the word of God, tear pages out of the word of God and bend it to my life because it's all about me after all. And we will never get to revival that way. Christians today say, I want revival. What they mean is I want longer worship. I want a rowdier worship service. And y'all, man, I am all about a rowdy worship service. Y'all know that. Well, I think we should be loud, singing Jesus' praises, tears sometimes, hands in the air. I believe that, but that's not revival. Revival is when God's people begin to bow to God's holiness and honor the word of God. Revival is when the married couple in trouble that that says they hate each other decide this is wrong. And we're going to submit ourselves to the whole counsel of God's word. We're going to lay down our pride. We're going to go to counseling. We're going to admit our mistakes and flaws and work this out. Revival is when teenagers are no longer swayed by YouTube and TikTok influencers, but they start to dive into the word of God. Revival is when addictions are actually broken. Revival is when the focus of our heart shifts from, hey, my kingdom come, my will be done. I want what I want to No, I'm not God, you're God. God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, you have your way with me. That's revival. And it's only sanctification that can get us there. And then last, Paul ends with some language reminding them, hey guys, this is a church thing. And so we have to understand with sanctification, there's an element that we cannot deny. This is a church matter, not just a personal matter. The minute you place yourself out on this Christian island, falling for the lie that your life does not affect anyone else's, so what's the big deal? You have fallen for one of the devil's greatest lies because he hates the church. He wants to destroy healthy thinking about church. Remember, church is not a time on the calendar. It's not a building. It's not a pastor and the church staff with their microphones. Church is us. Okay, to be very clear, church is actually not you by yourself. Church is not any single me. Church is we. 
Churches when every me starts to understand me as part of we. That's church. And whether we want to deny it, whether we don't like it, what we do has implications on other people's lives. How we live affects other people's lives. So don't let yourself get into this thinking. It's, it's my life, I'll do what I want. Well, that's the old way of living. That's the world's way of living. The church is supposed to shine a bright light. The church is supposed to be the salty seasoning in this earth. And if we're gonna reclaim our salty taste and reclaim our ability to shine a bright light in the darkness, we're gonna have to stop thinking and living like the dark world lives. We're gonna have to stop doing those old things from the old way of living. We must commit ourselves deeply to the faith and live by that faith, this process called sanctification. I think what happens too often in church today, and this is where your personal responsibility plays into church, and, and we're gonna do everything we can to build God's kingdom in and through your life. That's our promise to you as a church. But at the end of the day, I cannot be, I cannot be responsible for your soul you are personally responsible for your faith in your soul. And so many people, they, they just kind of come into church and they treat it like a show and then they walk out. But their life's no different when they walk out. And so the world looks at them and goes, what's the big deal? The church is no different than us. I mean, yeah, they go and they sing some songs and have a TED talk or whatever, but the church is no different than us. And we lose our ability to be the salt and the light. Sanctification is not just a personal thing, it's a church thing. Okay. You opened up that new tab, you can close it. We're done. Go back to the Lazarus tab. I want to finish the story of Lazarus. Next, what happens is you actually get the, sh the shortest verse in all of the Bible. It says, uh, Jesus wept. Maybe you can memorize that one. Okay. He wept over the death of his friend Lazarus. He, he kind of has a little argument with the disciples. And then he goes to the tomb where Lazarus is buried. And I want to pick up right there in verse 38. Jesus says, roll the stone aside. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, again, the Bible's funny, okay? Lord, he'd been dead four days. <laughs> the smell will be terrible. And I love how Jesus like completely ignores her concern. He says, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. And then Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I'm praying this one out loud because these people need to hear it. I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. And Jesus shouts into this tomb, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. The dead man was brought back to life. It's a picture, a sprinkling of salvation. But I want you to see what's next in the story his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. So yeah, Lazarus moved from death to life, but he was still dressed like a dead guy. And so many people today that genuinely love Jesus, they're still dressed like a dead guy. Because while they did place their faith and trust in Jesus, salvation, regeneration, justification, they never allowed the grave clothes to start coming off. They never engage in sanctification. Salvation's just really the beginning of the next part of God's plan called sanctification, where the grave clothes have gotta come off, where the dead smell has got to come off. Sanctification is you working out your salvation. Without sanctification, you're still dressed like a dead guy. Would you bow your head and close your eyes and pray with me? If you already have said yes to Jesus at any point in your life, I would just remind you what, what we're reminded of right here in Lazarus' story. It's time to take the grave clothes off. You see, every single one of us, even after coming to faith in Jesus Christ, we still have the stench of sin. There's still the odor of death in our lives from habitual behaviors and sinful patterns of thinking and bad decisions and, and these things, they're still infecting our lives. They're still affecting our lives. Jesus said, take the grave clothes off. Come on, join me in a new way of living. As some of you, you said yes to Jesus at some point and then he came to take off those grave clothes and instead of running to him, you ran from him. 
You were confused by some of what you were learning. You were uncertain, and so your life still smells like death. But you don't have to live that way anymore. You don't have to live in sin anymore. You don't have to live in hurt anymore. You don't have to live in confusion anymore. Those grave clothes can be removed, be sanctified. And then for anyone who has never trusted Jesus with their life, I've always kind of wondered when I read this story, like I actually think that Lazarus was probably alive before they moved the stone. I think Jesus had already resurrected him. And I just picture Lazarus kind of stumbling around in this, this dark tomb. You know, his head's still wrapped up. He can't see anything. He's banging into walls. He's just totally confused. But his miracle was already in progress. And that could be your very story. And you can't deny it. Like you're here today because you, your grandma or your mama prayed you into church. Some of you know what I'm saying. You're here today because your wife nagged you into church. You're here today because your, your friend invited you to church, but it wasn't really part of your plan. And God's been working on you. He's been doing things in such a way you, you can't deny that he's doing something. He's leading you. And you've been stumbling around in the dark, stumbling around in death and, and the stench of, of sin. What if Jesus is saying plainly to you today, hey, you are dead but you can come back to life. Your sin can be paid for by his power, by his grace, by his blood through your faith. That's the only thing you have to understand to receive the free gift of salvation. You don't have to have all these doctrines and theologies figured out. You only have to understand that without Jesus, you're dead. And if you'll come to faith in him, you can begin to engage in this next movement of salvation that you heard about today called sanctification. We invite you to join us. We're not perfect, but Jesus is. We're not perfect, but we're in process. We're following our Lord, our leader. Join us. If that's you, tell God, yes. Tell him you're ready. You can tell him like this. We'll lead you in a simple prayer just in case you're like, I don't, I don't know how to tell God. Tell him like this. Let's pray it together. Heavenly Father, I surrender to you. I understand I'm dead without Jesus. I need resurrection. So I place my faith in the cross in the resurrection of Jesus. He is Savior, but he's also Lord. So God, I repent from my sin. Father, would you teach me and change me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's make some noise for what God's doing today. Come on, isn't he good?